You put the wrong justices on the Supreme Court, and this country will never, ever be the same. We have to pick one that's going to be there for 40 years. From one of the 20 judges on my list, who will uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Leonard Leo is the executive vice president of the Federalist Society. He advises President Trump on judicial nominations. The Federalist Society is about results. They see judges, along with the Republican Party, as pathways to power. You don't mess around with judges. You get them confirmed, you get them confirmed quickly. If you've got a group that's been insourced, into the White House to decide who the next Supreme Court nominee is, you ought to have some clarity as to who's funding that group and who's getting to make that call. I was here long before this president, and I will be doing what I'm doing, God willing, long after. to make America great again. In early 2016, Donald Trump seemed unstoppable. Republican leaders were nervous, and then they lost a conservative icon. Please join us and the candidates on our stage in a moment of silence for Justice Antonin Scalia. The death of Antonin Scalia left the future of the Supreme Court in the balance, and Trump's challengers saw an opening. And the next president of the United States has to be someone that you can trust and believe in to appoint someone just as good as Scalia, plus there may be at least two other vacancies. So you ask Mr. Trump to respond and say that he would, and he says that he would, but the bottom line is if you look at his record over the last 25 or 30 years, on issue after issue, he has not been on our side. Now, so what did you think about his debate? How did you do? The Trump campaign needed to win over skeptical conservatives, and they knew who to call. Uh, I received a phone call from uh, a federal Federalist Society member. His name is Don McGahn. And at the time, he was the general counsel of the, uh, of the Trump campaign. And he asked if I would be interested in visiting uh, with the candidate. And of course, the rest is well known. And what we did, and I, I just have it, um, we just took a Tell list these names of judges. You. And yeah. uh, I thought what I would do is put this forward, and this would be the list that I would either choose from or pick people very close in terms of the spirit and the meaning of what they represent. I uh, came up with a list. Uh, the Federalist Society was very much involved. As vice president of the Federalist Society, Leonard Leo had spent years patiently working to push the country's courts to the right. In Trump, he saw a chance to accelerate that project. The Federal Society makes a calculation, which is if we can lure otherwise never Trumpers, into the electoral fold, have them help us get Trump elected, that opens up avenues for us to shape the courts for decades to come. Months ago as a candidate, I publicly presented a list and pledged to make my choice from among that list. I am a man of my word. To understand the success of Leonard Leo is to understand how power works in Washington. The arc of Leonard Leo's career mirrors the rise of the conservative legal movement. Publicly, he's known as one of the leaders of the Federal Society as it rises in influence and power within Washington as a networking organization that also serves as an incubator for conservative ideas. There's, there's no secrets at the Federalist Society. Uh, everything we do is completely transparent. It, and it's awfully hard to keep a secret in an organization that's got 2,000 people sitting in a ballroom at a conference. So we, we, don't, we don't have any secrets. After years of neglect, the Constitution... Another less visible aspect of his rise has been his activism outside the Federalist Society. Over nearly two decades, Leo and his allies created a network of nonprofits that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars to support campaigns in favor of conservative judicial nominees. Their aim really was to spread the message that conservative judges need to retake the third branch of, of government. In public and behind the scenes, Leo is advancing an agenda many decades in the making. The conservative legal movement has changed America's courts, and it's changing the idea that government should play a central role in American life, an idea that stretches back to the 1930s. 
I pledge myself to a new deal for the American During the New people. Deal, the Supreme Court really expands Congress's power to intervene in the social and economic spheres of American life. The idea that the government can tell corporations, you know, what they could and could not do, that was already seen as, a, as an affront to libertarian conservatives. Larry Goldwater has received the highest... It is a cause of republicanism to resist concentrations of power. Private Conservative power. anger deepened as the Supreme Court expanded the rights of women and minorities and placed new limits on public displays of religion. And if the Supreme Court rules in the Mississippi cases that there must be a desegregation Can right now... Can the state participate in the religious training of our youth? To what extent... Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. We are weeping about is the mentality which is now in America. How did this happen? But we have a mentality in America which is anti-life and anti-family and anti-God. So those decisions really mobilized evangelical conservatives. Libertarian conservatives had already been up in arms since the New Deal and gave them a common enemy, which at that time was the Supreme Court and more broadly, the federal government. A counter-revolution was brewing and soon it found a leader. The leadership that I envision in Washington if I should have enough of your support, would be to take the lead in getting government off the backs of the people of the United States and turning you loose to do what you can do so well. It was a heady time for young conservatives, but at their elite law schools, they still felt like outsiders. When I went to law school, um, we realized that the dominant thought was very much a liberal view of the law. And so as a conservative, you really felt like you were at either in the minority or should be quiet and not really speak up. At Yale, Harvard, and the University of Chicago, conservative students began to organize. Our first idea was, I'll bet there are students that think like this in other law schools, and it'd be interesting to invite conservative law professors to come together and hold a conference. In 1982, the Federalist Society was born. The group spread quickly to other campuses, and its founders caught the eye of President Reagan's attorney general. I, Edwin Meese III, do solemnly swear. They had graduated from law school by that time and were looking for jobs, and so uh, I was able to recruit them uh, to work with me in the Justice Department. Edwin Meese saw these young lawyers as the vanguard of a new conservative approach to the law. Uh, being an originalist uh, means being a lawyer or a judge who is faithful to the Constitution itself, who applies it uh, as it actually reads. Robert Bork was the kind of judge Meese had in mind. In 1987, Reagan nominated him to the Supreme Court. If a judge abandons intention as his guide, there is no law available to him, and he begins to legislate a social agenda for the American people. The Bork hearings were a new front in a familiar cultural struggle, and conservatives were still losing. In Robert Bork's America, there is no room at the end for blacks, and no place in the Constitution for women. And in our America, there should be no seat on the Supreme Court for Robert Bork. The Bork nomination becomes sort of a catalyzing moment for the conservatives. We need to change other institutions. We need to create a counter media. Um, we need to create a counter elite that makes things like originalism, conservative legal thought acceptable and more mainstream. Because for ideas to have consequences, there was a recognition that you needed the right people with access to positions of power. And that's where Leo comes in. Good afternoon. My name is Leonard Leo and I am National Lawyers Division Director of this Federalist Society. Leonard Leo joined the Federalist Society in 1991. A master networker, he also understood the ways of Washington. But the idea was really to create a pipeline, to create a pipeline that started in law school and then glided into the legal profession by building a network or infrastructure of people around the country who could influence the major power centers of our, of our legal culture. Republicans were primed to take who got appointed to the courts politically seriously long before Democrats were because Democrat interests were winning and they have built a very significant 
infrastructure as a result, and we've been caught napping for a long time. The Federal Society is in this for the long run. Since 1982, they have gone about collecting names aggressively, waiting for times when Republican presidents come into office so that they can work in partnership with Republican administrations to choose judges. We're not a lobbying organization. Uh, we, are not, we are not an advocacy organization. The emphasis and the focus is on ideas and the, the political results that people see happening are not things we're doing, although they are, you know, they're byproducts in the sense that you get people together who care about ideas. In his early years, Leo's largely working as an executive of the Federal Society, but he, he comes into his own during the Bush years, just as the Federal Society is rising in stature. As soon as he took office, President George W. Bush focused his energy on the federal courts. George W. Bush very much sold himself as a movement conservative. Um, and so because of that, he's able to tap into what is now a more mature federal society organization with a bigger farm team. I'm pleased to welcome my judicial nominees to the White House. A federal judge holds a position of great influence and respect and can hold it for a lifetime. But his most conservative nominees were blocked by Senate Democrats there's a realization in the administration that they need to get tougher and harness the power of outside groups, some of which Leo has helped conceive of, to fight back and to push through these nominees with tougher tactics. The Washington Post has obtained previously unpublished emails from the Bush White House. And this is the BH group. Oh yeah, here it is, Sean. Leonard Leo will probably know. They show Leo's office was helping coordinate all outside coalition activity on judicial nominations and working closely with Brett Kavanaugh, then a legal advisor to the president. As a political operative, Leo had some crucial talents. He had great contacts into the world of wealthy conservative donors, and he knew how to raise money. When the White House needed someone to help pay for a press conference on behalf of a stalled judicial nominee, an administration official suggested Leonard Leo will know we probably don't want the Fed sock paying for it, but he might know some generous donor. During those early Bush years, Leo became really adept at working with his network to cultivate allies and shape public opinion through ads and other campaigns. In 2005, a group of activists working with Leo launched the nonprofit Judicial Confirmation Network, or JCN, with funding from a small group of anonymous donors. Judge Alito is one of the most accomplished when President Bush nominates Samuel Alito and John Roberts in 2005 and 2006 to join the Supreme Court, JCN and other groups in this outside coalition spend $15 million in a campaign to support them. Although these campaigns were coordinated from Washington, they often had a very local feel. You know who they are, the folks who sue towns for putting up nativity scenes and menorahs, who tell little girls in the first grade that they can draw pictures of our savior, Jesus Christ, for class projects. Now these extremist groups want our senators to vote against Judge Alito for the United States Supreme Court. When I was working on the Hill, um, we would see um, these sort of attack uh, campaigns and so that was sort of um, the beginning of a tremendous, I think, investment that began uh, by the far right to pressure the nominations process to try to put judges on the bench who would achieve political objectives. John Roberts and Samuel Alito would take their places on the court, joining Federalist Society members Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia. At the group's 25th anniversary gala, Scalia gave a triumphal toast. We thought we were just planting a wildflower among the weeds of academic liberalism, and it turned out to be an oak. Their power is only manifested during times when Republicans are president. It's voted to confirm Judge Sonia When Sotomayor. Obama or Clinton Judge were, Judge were in office, they the very faded much very much yes. into, the, into the background. That doesn't mean they stop working.
For years, the conservative legal movement had been working to weaken campaign finance regulations with the support of corporations. We said, let's apply that principle that a corporation is, a, is an individual or a person, just a corporate person, and apply it to the principle of speech, that they can have speech rights, spend their money to advocate certain positions. In 2010, the Supreme Court agreed in a decision that would transform American politics. The Supreme Court has ruled five to four today to allow corporations to spend money to pay for TV ads. Connect the dots. Republicans are the party of the corporations. The judges are the appointees of the Republicans. And the judges just delivered for the corporations. It is being done in plain view. So they've unleashed corporate and special interest money. It's a massive, massive political advantage. It's like um, giving them modern artillery uh, as opposed to simple muskets. After the Citizens United ruling lifts restrictions on corporate spending, Leo, his activity really picks up and there's a proliferation of nonprofit groups that he helps run. They include a Tea Party group run by Clarence Thomas's wife, Jenny Thomas. He became director of an anti-abortion group called Students Christa for Life Hawkins, of America. President of Students for Life, a national organization of campus pro-life groups. Good morning. Those are among more than two dozen nonprofits that Leo advised or helped run over the last decade. And we looked through financial documents and tax filings to try and get a sense for uh, the significance and scope of these groups. From those documents, we found that between 2014 and 2017 alone, these nonprofit groups raised more than $200 million, much of it in anonymous donations. Let's remember that in this country, uh, the abolitionist movement, the women's suffrage movement, the American Revolution, the early labor movement, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s were all very much fueled by very wealthy people, and oftentimes wealthy people who chose to be anonymous. I think that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Leo had the network and the resources to push through a new generation of conservative judges, but he needed a partner in the White House. For whatever reason, they say this could be the presidency this next four years, where you'll pick more Supreme Court justices than anybody has ever had the opportunity to do. And believe me, I'll make you very proud of those justices. That Did Donald Trump know a lot about the Supreme Court? I sincerely doubt that. But he knew that by talking about the Supreme the justices Court. Justices that I'm going to appoint will be pro-life. They will have a conservative bench. By declaring that the Federal Society would provide him with a list of nominees, he'd be able to galvanize the right-wing base of the Republican Party, and in doing so, get them out to vote. In March 2016, Trump met with Leo at a DC law firm to discuss who he should choose as the late Antonin Scalia's replacement. He had an idea he wanted to float, which was, what do you think of having me put out a list of people who I would pick from for the U.S. Supreme Court? Now, this was a little bit of a radical idea. Um, no candidate had ever tried it before. I set about to suggest to him uh, names of people who, uh, who would be appropriate for, uh, uh, for that kind of a list. The problem is that once you give somebody the job of making and maintaining that list, you then give them an enormous amount of power. Unelected, unaccountable power. As Leo advised Trump on filling the open seat, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell did his part to keep the seat open. The Senate will appropriately revisit the matter after the American people finish. With help from a $7 million media campaign by Leo's allies at JCN. The Supreme Court has a vacancy, and your vote in November is your only voice. The American people should decide. What started off as unlikely, impossible, 
is now reality. This was an earthquake unlike any earthquake I've really seen since Ronald Reagan in 1980. It just came out of nowhere. Soon after the election, Leo made a trip to Trump Tower in New York. He would later take a leave of absence from the Federalist Society to join Trump's transition team. It was a very productive meeting. Uh, President Trump wanted to talk to us about uh, how important he views the selection he's going to have to make in the coming months. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. The time swear. for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Within weeks of taking office, President Trump delivered on his vow to conservatives with a judge from Leo's list, which had grown to include 25 names. Thank you. Today, I am keeping another promise to the American people by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch. Was this the choice you advised President Trump to make? Well, my job was just to give him a list of great people and to tell him everything I could about each of them. It was ultimately his decision. Was he on the list? Neil Gorsuch? Yeah. Oh, yeah. During the Trump era, Leo becomes more than just an activist and a fundraiser. He takes on a role as Trump's judicial advisor. Deciding who to pick for the United States Supreme Court. And Leonard, you were fantastic, all of your work. But he's still playing a behind-the-scenes role in campaigns to support the same judicial nominees that he's recommending to Trump. The Washington Post and other entities are more than welcome to write stories about money and politics. But I don't engage in that conversation because, one, I'm not partic particularly knowledgeable about a lot of it, but secondly, because it's just not what I do. In 2016, Leo starts three new nonprofits, Freedom and Opportunity Fund, America Engaged, and BH Fund. They're all created by the same law firm in Warrenton, Virginia. They also have no employees, they have no office space, no website, and virtually no public profile. The Washington Post asked Leo about one of the groups. Could you describe to us what the purpose of the BH Fund is? Um, BH Fund is a charitable organization. You can look it up, but I'm sure its statement of purpose is listed. We did, and its tax document says its mission is to promote the rule of law and limited constitutional government. And it received $24 million from an anonymous donor in 2017. I have a very simple rule, which is I'm engaged in the battle of ideas and I care very deeply about our Constitution and the role of courts in our society. And I don't waste my time on stories that involve money and politics, because what I care about is ideas. There's a reason why the Founding Fathers wrote the Federalist Papers anonymously, and it's because the power of ideas is what matters in our country. Leo and his allies promote those ideas through their obscure, very well-funded network of nonprofits. And this is one way they do it. BH Fund gives millions of dollars to both Freedom and Opportunity and America Engaged. America Engaged gives a million dollars to the lobbying arm of the NRA. The NRA then announces a million dollar ad campaign targeting senators who supported gun control and pressuring them to vote for Neil Gorsuch. Claire McCaskill talks a good game on gun rights. I'm a Second Amendment the advocate. I was raised Barack in a hunting Obama's culture in rural Missouri. Missouri. We shouldn't be taking Judge guns away from law-abiding citizens in this country. Judge Neil Gorsuch. The men and women of the National Rifle Association are responsible for the content of this advertising. Gorsuch would sail through his Senate confirmation but Trump's next nominee would be the true test for Leo and the network he had spent years building. The committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Yeah. Over two years, Leo's Freedom and Opportunity gave more than $4 million to another group called Independent Women's Voice. And when Brett Kavanaugh was accused of sexual misconduct, the group mobilized. Tammy Bruce is a radio show host and president of Independent Women's Voice, and she joins us tonight. So Tammy, Tammy Bruce is with us, and Tammy is the Fox News friend. contributor, radio host, Tammy, Tammy Bruce. Tammy Bruce, thank you all for being here. You were shaking your head a lot. It's president, moment. Tammy Bruce, appeared on Fox News regularly. Like other people in Leo's network, they defended Kavanaugh vigorously. Grassroots support for Judge Kavanaugh is strong, 
especially in Facebook. And organize social media campaigns on Facebook and other platforms. While the campaigns are unfolding, it's nearly impossible for the public to know who's funding these efforts. And by the time the groups are required to disclose the information, the battles are usually over. The judges have taken their the seats. The nomination of Brett M. Kavanaugh of Maryland to be an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States is confirmed. With Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch confirmed, conservatives now hold a majority on the nation's highest court. We see a court that is, in traditional measurements, 5-4 and a more conservative view. Um, that's been, you know, would, would have been viewed as an impossibility back when I was in law school. With Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh now in place, could the landmark abortion law, Roe v. Wade, be at risk? The Supreme Court allowing the Trump administration's ban to restrict transgender men and women from serving in the military. The Supreme Court has just dealt a huge blow to organized labor. President Trump wins. The Supreme in Court Trump's first two years, the Republican-controlled Senate has pushed through a historic number of federal appeals court judges. So much of what the federal courts do affects our daily lives, but is, is sort of not as visible. So challenges to emissions rules, uh, challenges to the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. How safe is our food gonna be? And so these are kind of real tangible ways that the courts can either make our country safer or more equal or more just, or really thwart the attempts of political majorities at the state and federal level to do so. And I've been very pleased actually of the growth of this whole movement, which I think is necessary for the benefit of the country and particularly the benefit of people who believe in the liberty and a system of justice that is fair to all. In December of 2017, Leo was honored at a gathering of conservative activists at the Trump Hotel in Washington. Leonard Leo has single-handedly changed the face of the judiciary under the auspices of Ed Meese and many of the people who started the Federalist Society. He has many hats. He, that isn't even all he does. He doesn't really tell all that he does, but I know enough to know the man is a force of nature. The problem here is not Leonard Leo. He is not a king of Republican judicial appointments. He is a fixer. He is a factotum. The interests behind him, who are anonymous, but who are paying for this exercise, that's what we need to worry about. What you're seeing now is the culmination of over 30 years of work. I was here long before this president, and I will be doing what I'm doing, God willing, long after. <laughs>